Hi there and uh, welcome to this week's demo. So this week I have been talking a bit about colour theory and in particular we looked at the, um, there's a sort of natural, natural progression through colour theory um, starting with local colour which is when you paint objects basically the colour you perceive them under fairly neutral lighting. Um, then we go up to optical colour and that's something a bit more associated with impressionist painters and that's painting things under the um, more affected by the conditions of light um, so in particular if you think of things like um, sunsets or sunrises or mist all those things the um, the you know the atmosphere and the light um, they have more of an impact than for example local color so that's the next stage and then we talked a little bit about um, arbitrary colour and that's really the idea that um, any colour, you can put down any colour you like. Um, so through Impressionism what happened is um, slowly as people start to exaggerate lighting effects um, eventually colour almost detached from what, the, you know, what you're actually observing and we see that with uh, artists. Um, emerging out of Impressionism, we looked at Pointillism and um, then we looked at the Fauvists and uh, some of their art and the colours they were using, uh, Matisse as well. Bright colours, uh, quite non, non sort of realistic, but at the same time, um, you know, there is more, I think there's more going on there than just picking out nice colours. Um, I think they're trying to evoke mood and atmosphere through colour. And then also we looked at symbolic colour, which is where you're using colour deliberately because of its sort of symbolic associations, which um, the idea is that some of those um, colour symbolism sort of transcends particular culture. But, you know, there are certain, um, we talked a little bit, I think, about Mondrian, and there were certain um, philosophical schools of thought that sort of, um, had whole sort of systems for thinking about colour in symbolic terms. So my suggestion was to have a go at one of these uh, more colourful approaches basically, that's the simple sort of summary of it. Um, and so this is me having a go as well. So I, I wasn't sure what to do this morning um, and I was wasn't quite sure I was sort of visualizing painting you know it's quite an important aspect of being a painter is you you try to sort of um, you know you imagine your painting before you've done it it's uh, it helps and you're drawing on your you know your knowledge of painting what you've done before how you might develop it further so I was having a bit of a think and I looked at some various options but I came back to this great photograph of a tree in Christchurch Park and I thought it would be nice to give that a go. There's quite a lot going on here in terms of like the textures and it's also um, the actual reference photo has got quite a lot of colour in it. So having picked that as my reference I went to the studio and set myself up as you see using my simplified palette, burnt umber, ultramarine, rose, yellow and white, so a very simple colour palette. Um, but I also had a, I sort of was skimming through um, some Cezanne books. Cezanne's very interesting in this respect because certainly some, some of his painting, you know, his colour, although it is grounded in observation, um, there are lots of tiles of colour and he's interested in the play of these tiles beside each other. So I was having a look at that and um, that got me thinking about how to make a start. So you can see what I've done is um, my initial idea was to um, sort of substitute um, grey, darks, umbers in my shadows for lighter um, sort of blues and purples. So this was how I got going. And as you can see, I'm still using this uh, sort of fragmented approach of putting down lots of different tiles of paint, building it up like a patchwork. 
which goes, you know, it is quite, it's quite different. Um, normally I'm more inclined to um, block in areas. Um, so blocking in, once you've established your shapes, by blocking in you cover large areas in a sort of base colour. So perhaps a dark for the shadows and then put the variations on over the top. Um, this canvas has already been toned with um, burnt umber and white. Um, but I am I'm not blocking in so there's not much terps there might be a little bit to make the paint flow but I'm uh, just putting them in one tile at a time and uh, just trying to get some of these areas blocked in and as you can see I was um, the um, I don't know if it's a problem, but, you know, I'm so used to painting in a um, sort of more sort of traditional figurative way um, that even though I wanted to vary my colours, I it was still very difficult to resist the temptation to try to colour match. Um, so as you can see, as the tree goes up where it's darker, it's definitely a warmer brown. So this is why I sort of went to the reds here. So I was responding to what was there. Um, but I think um, I was trying to heighten the colour and push it a bit further. So for example, substitute the shadows for blue and some of these browns for reds. And then just sort of have a look and see how the painting, you know, what did the painting require? As you can see, this, this approach benefits a great deal from having the toned ground. It makes it much easier to sort of, for the colours to start um, interacting. Um, more so than if it was on a white ground where everything, all these colours would look relatively a bit dark on a white canvas. So I think if you're going to have a go at this at home, I would, um, I would suggest um, toning the canvas, but not necessarily this umber. That's more of a, um, as a ground, that more works for, I would say, realistic sort of subdued um, painting. Um, than this sort of high key, bright, um, more sort of fauvist approach. I've mentioned before one of the good artists to look at in this respect is uh, Hashim Akib, who uh, uses, um, certainly in some of his books, uses very bright grounds um, and that becomes an integral part of the painting. So that's something you can play with as well. The advantage with acrylics, of course, is you can do very bright backgrounds and they will dry quite quickly. Uh, with oils, if you're going to use bright grounds, uh, you need to give really give it time to dry. Uh, you can work into it when it's wet, but it will bleed into all your colours and that can make life quite difficult when it comes to judging your values. So I have taken on this subject before, but in charcoal, um, I've these trees are very old oak trees in Christchurch Park. Um, they make for really good subjects, I think. So um, a good suggestion is I, I was saying to have a go at, you know, do several of these. Um, and especially when you swap style, um, I say one painting by itself it looks like a bit of an anomaly um, whereas if you do you know if you do three four maybe even a series of paintings all using a similar um, visual language mark making language then it will make more sense it will seem like a progression um, this ha this however does relate to the painting I did last week of the uh, of Southwold um, so there is a sort of, there's a development there. Okay. 
and I think even when I was doing my um, portrait paintings um, earlier on in the lockdown um, I did start to gravitate more towards this idea of the discrete tiles of colour and uh, I think that that's definitely one of the things that has emerged in my painting um, over the last few months. So it might be worth just saying a little bit about um, how this fits in um, with the the big picture of learning to paint. Um, so what I often talk about when people start painting with me is a sort of hierarchy of um, ideas or skill sets um, when it comes to painting and drawing. Um, and say so the first one is drawing. So. Although the colours that I'm using here are more um, bright and expressive, um, the drawing isn't particularly haphazard. So I, ha I have made an effort to observe it and in particular try to get that feeling of th this, this sort of zigzaggy feeling um, and a feeling of you know, the way it reaches over. Um, so I've tried to capture that. So drawing is like the, um, it's the fundamental skill um, of painting. Um, and it's one of these things that it's really worth practicing. It's where you I say, it's where you get the most, um, if you're going to invest time at the beginning, um, then investing it in your drawing skills is a good place to start. Having said that, when you're painting, you are also practicing drawing, okay? but. I'm talking here more about the the outlines, um, your ability to sort of communicate um, three dimensional form with mark making and uh, those sorts of things, proportion um, and composition and design. So they're the they're the elements of drawing. And then the next um, thing to be aware of is tonal values and. Uh, someone left a very nice comment for me the other day about my tonal values and uh, I mentioned that I had done quite a lot of printmaking when I was at university and um, being able to think in terms of black, white, neutral um, or grey um, and simplifying tonal values to create strong design. Uh, I think that's a lesson I learned um, really well by doing printmaking. So when you're doing things like etchings or lino cuts and you're working just with black and white, um, it really pushes you to sort of consider your tonal values. Um, and uh, it's, it's what sort of um, drives a painting, for me anyway, is sort of nice, strong uh, sort of tonal design that communicates light and form um, and a sense of the three-dimensional. So tonal values and then uh, on top of that colour, okay, so colour really is the icing on the cake, but colour is what tends to drive the emotional impact of a painting. Uh, good colour um, really does, uh, it can be one of the first things that a person might notice about a painting. They might not see the drawing or the tonal values, but they will just respond quite directly to, um, you know, good colour. And in fact, um, having uploaded this, I've already had, you know, uh, Jane from my Monday class said she likes these, you know, these bright colours. So people do, they, they respond to colour. So it's, uh, and with the naturalistic approach, you know, you're tending to subdue colour. Um, but here it's a real opportunity for me at least to, um, to try and play around with brighter colours. So they all sort of work as a hierarchy, but um, and you're developing all of them um, at the same time. Um, but certainly oils and acrylics, um, you have to think tonally. I mean, you have to with watercolours. And where I think um, 
learning to paint with watercolors one of the problems um, there is it's easy to sort of skip tonal values so you can do a draw a pencil drawing and then start to put color on over the top and you haven't really thought um, clearly enough about a simple tonal pattern so whatever medium you're working in you need to sort of um, have developed those uh, those three skill sets drawing tone and color so we had a little pause there um, but as you can see so with this um, approach of laying the tiles one of the things that's creeping in here is the idea of there being a sort of rhythm so it's trying to get into a sort of um, it's almost like yeah it's like a, a flow a flow state where the brush strokes are going on at a nice steady pace not too much too much deliberating or thinking um, just trying to because that comes across in the painting you see um, there's no point in spending like hours sort of fiddling over little areas but it's this it's this um, steady sort of work like um, approach um, that I've been trying to develop and here I'm um, whereas normally I might have painted that sky in and put those um, twigs on over the top here I've left some of that background and I've tried to paint the negative spaces between the branches as I thought that was more of an interesting approach and helped sort of um, link the whole painting together it's one of the um, aspects of working in this uh, sort of fragmented style um, I say it gives the entire surface almost like a vibration these um, so all these dashes and dots um, again if you think of the sort of printed like a printed picture it's all composed of those very small colored dots um, and those colored dots are all over the um, image okay and there's they're almost like the ground from which the image emerges and uh, that's sort of the, <clears throat> the idea here with the painting, although a slightly, you know, these are quite large dots. But they tie the whole painting together so we don't have so much discrete objects, but the space and the objects are all um, sort of created from these little dots and dashes. So it's why it wouldn't have worked to have areas that were just painted as flat shapes in a painting like this. To create unity, um, it needs that sort of, um, the approach has to be thorough throughout. So the little vertical of the tree there um, behind um, this one. And I thought that's, again, that's quite a nice um, to play the sort of zigzags and the organic forms of the foreground tree off against a sort of straight um, like horizontal and vertical lines. I thought it was a nice sort of combination there. And also helps to imply some depth of the light hitting behind. So it's a little bit quicker this painting. Um, not quite as large a canvas as I have attempted um, for the last few weeks. Um, it's about time for me to go and get some new boards cut. That was one of the reasons. Um, but I thought as this is, um, I felt this was more in the realms of experimentation. So um, I thought better to go a little bit smaller than get bogged down in a great big canvas. Having said that, I was, I was pleased with the painting and uh, I think it's something, I think it would work, it would be really nice um, to have a go at uh, it on a bigger scale. So I'm sort of thinking ahead. Um, so I've got August off and the opportunity to do perhaps a couple of bigger paintings. 
Um, and so I'm thinking, I'm sort of thinking what I might do. And I'm quite intrigued by some of the things that have emerged this term, as I say, with the bright colours and these, um, these sort of chunks. So I might sort of play around with that a bit more. And if any of you are watching who um, come to my classes or are interested in coming to any of my classes, as you know, I've been uh, in lockdown, um, as we all have, um, since, uh, I think it must have been since April, beginning of April. Um, it seems to have flown by now. Um, so I've been making contact with my halls and just sort of finding out what the uh, arrangements will be for next term. But uh, so far, um, I'm fairly confident that I will be, um, mo almost all my classes, I believe, will be up and running next term. So that will be nice. Um, I'm thinking that probably I might have to um, wear a mask as long as there's still, um, certainly for myself, I mean, I, I will be um, probably going from class to class. So I'll be looking into that and all the sort of things we can do to make sure the classes are safe again. Um, but yeah, that's really, I'm really looking forward to that. So it's, uh, I really do enjoy my classes and it will be great to uh, see people again. Um, there may be some people that carry on shielding, of course, so that's always a, a possibility. Um, but for those that are keen to get out and about again, it should be nice to get back into something like the old routine. So here I'm sort of um, just edging slightly more back into the world of realism, um, just bringing out a highlight there. Um, and that's where the light was hitting the tree. So um, just bringing that area out. Again, it's nice to have a, a focal point and a bit of light in the painting. Just to help to bring out, you know, it's a nice, at its heart, it's a cylindrical form. So although it's got these big sort of grooves on it, um, it's a nice big cylinder. So that's, that's where the sun would have been hitting it more directly. Now I'm just looking at it and thinking, I gave some advice um, to my students for this uh, project. And the advice I gave was, when you're painting anything, um, there's a good theory from the book, The Simple Secret of Better Painting. And that's to let your painting be primarily one color. Okay, so you make it mostly something. And then you play other colors against it. Um, looking at it, if I was to be slightly critical, I don't think it's an it's not, you know, it's not an essential rule. Um, overall, this painting is mainly it's a warm painting. So I think when I started it, my intention was for the blue to dominate. But as it turned out, I think in the in the reds and even probably the warm um, umber underpainting still dominate the the overall feel. So I say it's quite a warm painting with these blues and greens playing off against that. But uh, if I was to do it again, I might be a bit more thorough in making one colour um, sort of predominate. Before I went out, I also had another look at my, uh, I was looking at Andre Duran and he was, um, say, one of the most famous sort of Fauvist painters and really trying to sort of get my head around, you know, how much of his choices of colour um, 
were sort of were they exaggerate was it exaggerated color or you know where was he picking his colors from and uh i can't say the answer is obvious although i i think um my sense is that the colors weren't random it, it wasn't just a case of like um a bit of this and a bit of that because he was still using things like um, blues for the distance and that sort of thing but also also interesting is as these artists um, as their color moved away from realism so also actually did the other two the drawing and the tonal values as we saw with van gogh in some of his he really abandoned the use of tone in favor of just pure color vibration um, and so with some of these fovis paintings as well you can see um, just a, a perhaps a more simplistic approach to the drawing um, that's not in a sort of negative way it's more that um, things weren't over labored so again it was coming out of this impressionist idea of um, like the energy of working with that sort of rhythm and that sort of pace you know um, the energy of a sketch which is, you know, was one of the ideas that informed Impressionism. So I'm still trying to make an effort to make each brush mark sort of stand on its own. Um, and there's a few little things I'm doing there, um, sort of just trying to imply a bit of reflected light in the shadow. Um, and uh, yeah, just trying to bring out the form slightly by little accents of colour. But I would say it was I enjoyed painting it, and uh, actually there's um, there are some great um, potential subjects. Christchurch Park, if we're lucky, is full of um, trees like this, and uh, yeah, they make I think they make really interesting subjects, especially when approached in this almost um, what would we say. Yeah, it's a sort of non-realistic style, I would say. It's it's more the the colours are um taking us more it's more expressionistic. We're more trying to feel something about the tree. Um that you don't get just by, for example, photographing it. So as I said, I'm going to be having a little bit of a break um, in August. And uh, so I, we've got one more week left. So if any of you are watching um, and if you haven't already, you know, by all means, send me something in, you know, even if, if you haven't subscribed um, and you would like some feedback. Um, I'm also going to be doing a couple of feedback sessions over the, um, the break. I'll perhaps try and do one in the middle of August and maybe early September. And that's in case anyone um, has was carrying on with the painting, perhaps been watching the videos and would like some sort of direction or suggestions. Um, so I'm more than happy to give people some, some feedback like that. Um, and then I'm hoping to also do some more videos. So it won't be a case of just, uh, although I'm planning a little bit of a break, um, at the end of August. I'm hoping I can use the time to do a couple of paintings. So I'm hoping I should be able to, um, you know, document that for you and show you what I've been up to and perhaps show you how some of these ideas that have emerged um, unfold. So, so it's interesting. I started the term on this very sort of um, very sort of realistic really i've been watching that uh, mark carter and draw mix paint uh, channel who you should check out and have a look at he's got some very good videos there 
Um, and then through exploring this material and putting together the classes, we've sort of gone into um, much less realistic territory. Okay, so I think I started doing a little bit of tidying up here actually before stopping the video. Um, but that is the um, that's the final painting. So coming up, we can have a look at what it looks. So here we are. Uh, this is a tree. Or old, the old tree in a Fauvist style. So as you can see, um, lots of different colours, um, non-realistic colours side by side, hopefully bouncing off each other, um, painted in a sort of intuitive style um, with lots of little chunks of colour. So yeah, I enjoyed that. Um, as I say, working with this is, a, is something new for me. And uh, I'm really enjoying seeing these colours working side by side. And uh, it's already given me some ideas about how to perhaps uh, proceed with the next one. So I hope you enjoyed that and found something useful in it. Um, I say, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Um, and uh, I will be here on Friday to have a look at some of my students' work and to give them some feedback. Anyway thumbs up if you like that always much appreciated and subscribe if you haven't already and i will see you again soon thanks a lot bye